what is the title of this video? <laughs> <laughs> the worst horror movies ever? Movies we hate. <laughs> horror movies we hate. Uh, that sounds pretty good. I am DS Lyons of the movie Blues. And I am Adam uh, at Review Bomb. And uh, we have decided to put our collective talents together to talk about the horror movies that we hate the most. Uh, it is a numbered list where the numbers mean absolutely nothing. Uh, because we hate all of these pretty much equally, although maybe we hate the last two more than the first eight we've decided. But uh, yeah, we hate pretty much all of these. Much like a you know a degree from an online university, the order doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just a general disdain for all of these. <laughs> I'm interested in the first one on your list because I don't even know. Again, like I told you, I didn't even know this movie existed, so I'm anxious to hear all about it. Uh, yes, we are going to kick off uh, the list first with my uh, number 10 choice, a, a sequel to a movie that I grew up uh, really loving and a series that I thought was really going to go places when I heard that they announced a sequel. Uh, without further ado, I guess let's start this list up with number 10. The Descent 2 asks the question, what if The Descent 1 was bought half price from Timu, written by AI that was solely fed the script from the first movie, and then hit over the head with a cast iron skillet? Not the mama! Not the mama! Not the mama! Everything you loved about Neil Marshall's pivotal horror classic, The Descent, is here, but worse, uglier, cheaper, and spineless. The fact that this movie has the brass balls to act like it's a direct continuation of the first film's final moments makes the differences between these two movies that much more glaring. While The Descent felt like it was actually shot on location in this horrifying, claustrophobic, subterranean hellhole, The Descent Part 2 looks like it was filmed on the set of The Agro Crag from Nickelodeon's Guts. This paper mache ass looking movie is so bad, so cringe, and so unnecessary that it's one of the rare sequels to actually retroactively injure the first film's reputation just by fucking existing. The plot here is clearly ripped from Aliens, where the main female protagonist of the first film is immediately convinced to return to the scene of the crime with a bunch of heavies. But here it just comes off as wildly unbelievable. Because while Ripley felt a moral imperative to fight the xenomorphs for a variety of reasons. How many colonists? I don't know, 60, maybe 70 families. The lead character from The Descent wakes up with amnesia in the hospital just to throw her spelunking gear back on and jump straight into the cave again like three hours later, without even remembering what happened the first time. Besides, she has no memory of the last two days. My name is Bucks, and I'm here to fuck. It's laughable, ridiculous, and wastes the opportunity to explore the creatures from the first film in any sort of meaningful or new way. It also undoes every major twist and plot point from the first film, sucking the tension out of both films at the same time, like a goddamn energy vampire. Sorry, Fred Mercury, but I am the champion. <laughs> the Descent 2 is bad, cheap, cursed, and wildly rushed, instantly plummeting one of the best movies of the early 2000s into instant franchise death. Leaving us with a lopsided duology so uneven that it hobbles around like Oz Cobb on his club foot from the Penguin. You gonna time me? How the hell am I supposed to get out of here? This is one of the worst sequels to ever sequel and one of the worst horror movies ever. They even resort to one of the cheapest sequel tactics you'll ever see in your life by literally watching the best, most iconic scare from the first movie on a camcorder which spooks them out and that becomes its own jump scare. This movie is bottom barrel. Wow, Adam, did you learn so much from our ride through The Descent 2? I feel like I've sat at the foot of a scholar. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, where did you, this wasn't a theatrical release, was it? At the time, VOD didn't exist, so I think this was a, like a straight to Redbox experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> this was not a movie you could catch at the local multiplex. Uh, this was more like a disease you could only catch at certain parties. Uh, would you like to queue up our next choice here? I see that it's from a series that uh, I would say has many, many terrible entries in it. Uh, that is true. Uh, the series, even the good entries in this series are pretty objectively uh, terrible, uh, but at least they tend to be a lot of fun. As you'll see that with uh, this entry, that tends to be my biggest issue is that it just isn't. All right, take me there. 
You know, taking over a major U.S. city is a rite of passage for any great movie franchise. The Muppets did it, Scream did it, Debbie did it, and, with this entry on the list, Jason did it. By abandoning his old killing ground of Camp Crystal Lake, sneaking onto a cruise ship full of high school students, and killing everyone as it makes its way to Manhattan, a city famous for its pizza, street gangs, Fuck you, son. and sidewalks covered in human poop. Now, was this location change a desperate attempt to breathe new life into a franchise that was way past its prime? Yes, it was. Did it work? Absolutely not. In fact, all it did was bore audiences with the same old tropes that had been going stale for the better part of a decade. Do you like old, rundown boats? that are used in low-budget movies? Well, I hope so, because this film explores literally every inch of this dilapidated sea vessel in a desperate attempt to hide the fact that it was made on a budget so small that they couldn't actually afford to take Jason to Manhattan, even though that's literally the name of the movie. <laughs> So by now, you're probably asking yourself, do they ever actually go to Manhattan? Well, eventually, yes. And by Manhattan, I mean Vancouver, where the only interesting thing that happens is this. Ultimate punch! Now, it's no secret that the Friday the 13th franchise isn't exactly high art. And from the very start, it's always been about horny teens played by bad actors who recite terrible dialogue while trying to not be killed. So, to criticize Jason Takes Manhattan for staying true to the brand, would be kind of silly. However, the one saving grace that most of the movies in the franchise have is that they're at least fun to watch. Yes, it's trash, but at least it's entertaining trash. This movie, however, isn't entertaining at all. In fact, it commits the greatest sin that any slasher movie could make, and that's being boring. And a big part of that is because the movie is hampered by its boat location, which is just visually uninteresting, it's paced terribly, it's way too long, and thanks to the meddling of the Motion Picture Association of America, this movie can't even rely on cool kills like previous franchise entries. The whole movie is just a perfect storm of awful, and is a prime example of what happens when a franchise goes on for too long and has nothing left to offer. Or does it? <laughs> Wow. Love the teaser at the end of this one. Uh, I definitely think that uh, Jason X is a much more enjoyable movie than Manhattan. I think Manhattan definitely commits the ultimate sin in a movie like this is that it's boring and, and it sucks. Uh, you can't have both. As maybe some people have seen, there is a new Stephen King adaptation that uh, just came out on HBO Max called Salem's Lot. It's supposed to be a big piece of shit. And uh, that is another footnote in a long, long history of shitty Stephen King movies based on sometimes shitty Stephen King books. I tend to avoid Stephen King anything, typically, just because it's usually awful. I agree, uh, and I think really uh, that awfulness hit uh, its ultimate peak uh, with the next movie on our list. So let's uh, get into it now. Dreamcatcher is a movie that I'm sure a lot of us find to be a bit nostalgic at this point. In fact, I wouldn't be shocked if this was the entry point for a lot of people into the work of Stephen King. And not for anything, this is actually a good representation of the best and worst of King, in that it's an overbloated, inconsistent, jumbled mess made by a dude who had just survived a car accident and several decades of flagrant cocaine abuse. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> Dreamcatcher is basically It meets Independence Day, a pile of genre throw-up that follows a group of former childhood friends as they return to the place they grew up in, to battle an unknowable evil. But while It is a tense, nuanced, and also cocaine-infested epic, with hard-hitting set pieces and a great villain, Dreamcatcher is scare-free, disgusting, morbidly stupid, and downright embarrassing. All right, now this in case you have to... You know, irk. It's a head trauma influenced epic that centers around Marky Mark's brother from The Sixth Sense, playing a recorded guy who's actually a giant butthole alien in human skin who's pretended to have cancer his whole life. I'm in tremendous pain! I'm in tremendous pain! Help me! Help me! Help me! And that isn't even mentioning the B plot that takes place fully in a character's psychic memory warehouse as he's hunted by an alien with a British accent. Let's be friends! Are you speaking to me? We're going to take a little journey. Or the C-plot that follows another cocaine legend, Tom Sizemore, as he fights Morgan Freeman's caterpillar eyebrows in an all-out war between aliens and the army. Well, I'm that dog. I'm that monster. This is like 
five bad B movies, three bad Stephen King movies, and 4,000 bad creative decisions wrapped into one legendary mess. Crazy. <laughs> All of Stephen King's worst tropes and none of his best strengths are on full display here. Leaving Dreamcatcher is one of the most boneheaded, embarrassing, exhausting, and excrement-fueled movies of the 2000s. Oh, man. So, if you've ever desired to watch a traumatic remix of It with aliens that burst out of your butt, this is literally the only movie for you. Adam, ever seen Dreamcatcher before? I have. I saw. <laughs> I saw, actually saw this one not long after it was released on DVD, and much like you, I was just like, what is this? <laughs> Why? Why is any of this happening? Why did someone read this book? turn it into a script and say, let's make a movie. It's just so terrible. The next uh, item on our list here is a movie about a very famous curse. Now, this is one of actually several movies that you have picked for your list where I find the sequel to be so bad that I've never considered that the original was particularly awful. This movie has probably the worst sequel of any of the movies on this list that we have. Uh, since watching your section here, I'm definitely re-evaluating my thoughts on it, and I know that this is going to be a controversial pick, so I'm going to let you take it from here. It's true. Uh, I am aware that this will be controversial. Boo this man! No! Uh, after making this segment, I was wanting to refresh myself. How does the world feel about this movie? What's the zeitgeist feel? And I'm surprised to see that a lot of people feel differently. But what are you going to do? That's the way it goes on YouTube. So this is my most controversial segment of our video, I suppose. But I hope you like it anyway. Let's check it out. So now I have to be completely honest with everybody. The only reason I put this movie on my list of worst horror movies is so I could trick everybody into letting me talk about how much I love it. It literally has everything that you need for a horror classic like terrible child actors and retarded horses. The excitement of watching people traveling by car, traveling by ferry, or traveling by walking is palpable. And all of that, combined with the plot of an evil, psychokinetic orphan who was thrown into a well by her adopted mother and uses a haunted home movie to come back to life and kill people, makes it truly one of the greatest movies ever made. I can sense your sarcasm. Well, that's good, because words can express how much I hate this movie. And that hatred comes down to the key issue of that it's just terribly boring. Now, for those of you who don't know, the original Halloween is actually one of my favorite horror movies, so I can appreciate a movie that takes its time which is something that Halloween certainly does, with most of its kills taking place in the third act. However, the creepy atmosphere, the sense of danger, and the tension that's built up throughout the first two-thirds of the movie leaves the audience in a state of anticipation. The Ring, on the other hand, does the exact opposite, as it drags through long stretches of uneventful exposition and refuses to engage in any character development, while at the same time features characters who seem hell-bent on conducting their investigation into this mystery killer tape as slowly as possible. You would think that two people who have just been told that their son is going to die in seven days would try to pick up the pace a bit, but for some reason they don't. Well, honestly, that part I do understand, because if this was my kid, I probably wouldn't care if he lived or died either. And finally, the entire premise of a haunted killer video chain letter, for me, is on a level of stupid that I just can't get behind. Yes, I am well aware that most horror movies have this plot issue, but the tape thing is something I just can't suspend my disbelief with. What happens if the tape gets damaged? What if someone tries to watch the tape and then halfway through, they realize it's been taped over? Then what do you do? However, with all that said, the one thing we can give The Ring credit for is ushering in the era of terrible American remakes of Japanese horror films that dominated the early 2000s, so fuck you, The Ring. I gotta be honest, you bring up some very compelling points here. Um, <laughs> I don't think I ever considered how silly a haunted VHS tape was until I really heard somebody else say it in such a eloquent fashion. I understand that this is the director of Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, he is not a horror director, and I get everything that you said in this, but I will say that 
when that girl crawls out of the TV, that is top tier cinema. I, I can't be, I can't be talked down from that moment. But looking at the rest of this film through your lens here was very helpful in understanding how a person could think this movie was so bad. And I, I do, I do concede that it is a pretty audaciously stupid concept for a horror movie. Uh, technically, I think it's pretty. Well, it's well done, certainly. Uh, shot on film, uh, all color grading is done in camera. The type of filter they're using and the Kodak stock they're shooting on is like a high tungsten type film that's really rare, and it absorbs a certain type of blue and green in the uh, color spectrum, and it's all treated chemically. It's not done digitally at all. So uh, that's always impressive when somebody can accomplish that kind of stuff. I give them their props, but the movie itself is just... I just can't abide by it. The color grading thing, that's really interesting. Um, you've managed to give me another reason to love this movie, which is not the intent, I don't think, here, but... Um... <laughs> Let's move on to another uh, franchise here, unfortunately. This being one that uh, is about 99% terrible, 1% good. Um, this is... I think the worst entry uh, in this film series, although there are so many, uh, it was hard to pick just one, but this one I think made me laugh uh, by accident the most, so it automatically wins by default. I know of this movie, I saw half of it and then turned it off, so I'm interested to see what you have to say about the rest. Sometimes, late at night, I try to imagine the moment that led to Spiral from the Book of Saw's creation. I can picture Chris Rock atop a pile of unending cash, deciding between a fifth reboot of Everybody Hates Chris or the next Grown Ups movie. With the first Saw movie lightly playing in the background on his living room TV turned to TNT. Drifting off into an afternoon nap in his money cocoon, with the audio of Saw playing in the background, a dream comes to Mr. Rock. A dream to create something truly awful. Do I smell like jerk sauce and baby wipes? Me no want no partner. Are you woke now? I'm not woke, but you can't say handicapped, you can't say retarded. You gotta say special needs. We're trying to be respectful. And it was at that moment that he awoke from his nap, dropped all the hack scripts and cheap sequels out of his weird crab hands onto the ground, Realizing all at once in glorious horror that his next project was right in front of him all along. A stand-up-fueled, ACAB-adjacent police brutality version of Saw. Atop the Mount Olympus of the Who Is This Movie Made For Olympics is Spiral from the Book of Saw, a career moment so embarrassing for Chris Rock that the Academy actually hired Will Smith to wife-beat it out of him. Oh, wow! Wow. And he deserved it because Spiral is a top-down abomination, an unfunny, awkward, and ultimately accidentally hilarious not-comedy with a terrible new not-jigsaw who is punishing the police for simply doing their job badly like they want to do. Chris Rock's acting in this movie is a crime against theatrics, and the final twist at the end where they turn Samuel L. Jackson into a piggy marionette is hilarious as it is sad. Now, the Saw series does have some awful, rotten, misbegotten entries, but somehow Spiral coasts over the worst of the series by squandering the massive potential of a reboot and the talents of one Mr. Rock. Do you want to hear a bunch of jokes about Chris Rock's divorce in between gut-wrenching violence and head-splitting editing? I'm going through a divorce. Shit, sorry. Sorry for what, we're cops. Do you want to watch a Saw movie that feels like it was written by Rodney King on a notepad while he was high on crack and running from the cops? Then boy, do I have the, the movie for you. I hope I never, ever have to talk about Spiral ever again, and you're welcome. The Saw franchise as a whole, you could just throw a dart at any of them, and they're all just awful. I will give them credit that they have tried to, like, weave a coherent or somewhat co coherent like through line like they're all tied together so it's like a saw universe I and mean, it's a universe built on garbage but still a universe nonetheless <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, our next choice on the list here is a movie that some people love not even like they love it they think it's high art they think it is a genius commentary on many different social issues and they think that it's another home run from a guy who uh, came out swinging in his career. Uh, but I hate this movie, and you, because you have put this movie on our list, 
assumedly hate this movie, and I would like to talk about it because this is uh, a movie that makes me real mad and real sad. Uh, yeah, again, maybe not as much as The Ring, but I think this one will also be kind of a controversial pick for me just because a lot of people do hold it in high regard for whatever reason. Uh, but I'll just let the segment speak for itself, uh, and then we can talk about it after it's over. Suspension of disbelief is the audience's willingness to accept the implausible for the sake of enjoying a story, and it's a crucial element in most horror films. After all, the concept of a dream demon who's killing teens in their sleep, a machete-wielding zombie that's killing campers, or, as I mentioned earlier, a killer videotape isn't exactly realistic. But, thanks to the suspension of disbelief, even the most absurd horror plots can work. However, with Jordan Peele's Us, the concept of suspension of disbelief is stretched to its breaking point, thanks to the premise that the United States government has cloned its entire population, kept those clones in underground tunnels, eventually eventually resulting in the clones rising up and killing their above-ground counterparts as a metaphor for classism. Right. Now, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with a film tackling social issues, and horror has long been a vehicle for addressing topics like race and class for decades. However, an issue does arise when a film's themes are presented so poorly that the message becomes muddled and ineffective. Just like landing a plane, you don't get points for the attempt, you need to stick the landing. Otherwise, this happens. <laughs> And that's exactly what happens with us, where the movie's message, which is delivered with all the subtlety of this, crumbles under the weight of a convoluted plot that makes suspending disbelief a Herculean task. Now, defenders might argue that I'm trying to be too literal, that the movie isn't actually about clones killing people, the film is using clones as a metaphor for class struggles. And yes, I am well aware of that. But even a metaphorical story must follow some sort of internal logic, and the logic of us crumbles under the weight of its own stupidity, demanding that elements of the plot that are meant to be overlooked for the the sake of the narrative are explained. Unfortunately, the explanations that are given are so weak that they actually hurt the narrative rather than help. And once the core elements of the plot begin to unravel, the whole movie collapses like a house of cards that's built on a foundation of stupid. Oh, fuck. Had Jordan Peele decided to be more restrained and tighten the focus of the movie on the Wilson family, the movie would have been much improved. It could have succeeded in the same way that The Twilight Zone or Black Mirror by leaning into surrealism without over-explanation. The same restraint could have also spared the audience from the movie's unnecessary necessary twist ending, which is so bad it feels like an M. Night Shyamalan twist. And no, I don't mean one of the good ones. I mean the God killed your wife so that your younger brother could beat up an alien with a baseball bat kind of twist. In the end, Us is a pretentious plot hole filled mess. A film that's so caught up in its own self-importance that it forgets to tell a coherent story. And it's a cautionary tale of what happens when a director starts to believe his own hype and loses focus by trying to fill his movie with too many half-baked ideas. Uh, I hate this movie. <laughs> Truly, I'm burying the lead, but I hate this movie. I mean, at the, at the moment where uh, all of the homeless clones who've been living in a subterranean high school or whatever are holding hands around the world, that was one of the most confused moments I think of my whole life in a movie. I've never been so disconnected from what the message of a movie was to what was happening on screen. I absolutely did not understand the end of it the first time I watched it and was like, what the hell did I just watch? So... Uh, it's not a movie I care to revisit, but I guess if it did it for you, um, congratulations. I don't know. Yeah, that was the worst part of this entire endeavor, was having to go back and rewatch parts of Us <laughs> to remind myself of what <laughs> happened. Um, and speaking of going back and watching a movie that makes you uh, really question why you got into the YouTube game in the first place, uh, let's talk a little bit about our next selection here. It is another worst of an entire franchise selection. It is another movie that really upsets me, and uh, I guess let's just get into it. 2018's The Predator finally asks the ultimate question that this series has always been building up to. If Marines can't kill the Predator, if police can't kill the Predator, if Machete himself and Adrian Brody shredded on steroids can't kill the Predator, 
than can a boy with autism? I'm hungry for an ass burger. Mmm, sounds delicious. It's a nice, big, juicy ass burger. Oh, yeah. Shane Black's The Predator is like if you took the Your Mommy's Put So Big joke from the original 1987 classic and stretched it to a full two hour runtime. You said eat my pussy. What the f is wrong with that? You said you're pushy. No, you said eat pussy. I said sheesh, you're pushy. No, you said eat my pussy. That's what he said. I heard it. He said he doesn't mean your like what are you saying? You're insane, right? This movie is like if you sucked out all the tension, amazing set pieces, and brutal violence of the Predator series and replaced it with an XL can of galaxy gas and a bag of flaming hot Funyuns as its brain. This is a film so spectacularly dumb and embarrassing that casting Olivia Munn as a brainy doctor is one of the most credible aspects of the whole movie. Shake it down, Olivia. Go ahead, get it down. Shane Black, in his infinite non-wisdom, and shortly after making the friggin' worst Iron Man movie he possibly could, decided to return to the series that kickstarted his acting career. Twisting the Predator series into a string of bad jokes, lame lore reveals, and cuddly little Predator dogs. This movie is a toxic cesspool of bankrupt creative choices. Ending in a crescendo of idiocy where they reveal a human Predator hunting suit that looks like Iron Man at a Slipknot concert. Whoever approved this script, whoever bankrolled this film, whoever believed in Shane Black's cut of this movie deserves to be stranded in an alien jungle and hunted for sport. This is a movie that makes AVP Requiem seem like a gothic masterpiece and is the absolute worst entry in either the Alien or Predator franchise. Yeah, this movie beat out Alien Resurrection to be on this list. A cursed, maniacally terrible movie in all ways. The Predator 2018 redefines the notion of a bad idea into two hours of laughable misery. This movie is truly the worst, and f reek. F reek sucks. This movie is, oh, it's the worst. So, yeah, The, the Predator, uh, because the one thing missing from the Predator series was a comedy entry. That's what the world needed to heal, and uh, I do not agree with that prescription. I think this is an example of more issues in the Hollywood system, whereas they're so desperate for anything while still having no like compass of originality that when they're just like, oh, the guy who was part of a production in the past, surely he knows what he's doing. And you're like, nope, <laughs> did not at all. It, it's like the comedy relief character from Predator gets to direct a Predator movie. It's like if you let Screech write a season of Saved by the Bell, it's not what anybody would ever want. <laughs> um, all right, uh, back to our franchise horror roots here. Uh, why don't you cue up our next selection, the number three hated movie on this list. Okay, so I'm not sure how the general public feels about this movie. I think not only is it bad, but it is an underlying symptom of what's happening in modern entertainment, and I don't want to give too much away about how I feel about it. So I'll just let the segment play, and, and we'll go from there. The Legacy Reboot Sequel, or Requel as it's more commonly called, has become common practice in Hollywood as movie studios try to use the built-in audiences of long-established IPs to desperately stay afloat and cling to life. A chief offender among this trend is next on my list, Scream 5, a movie that once promised to bring Scream's special brand of slasher-slash-murder mystery fun to a new generation, but instead rapidly fell victim to the requel tropes that we've all grown to know and hate, where a newer, younger character finds themselves in trouble and becomes friends with legacy characters who are now old and miserable, and then together they team up and beat the bad guy in a plot that's almost identical to the original film, while the script is sure to include enough easter eggs and in-universe references to make older fans of the franchise do this. <laughs> A formula that by the time Scream 5 was released, we had already seen done time, time, and time again. Now yes, I am well aware that the Scream movies of the past have all used movie references and tropes, that's nothing new. However, older Scream films don't just incorporate movie tropes, they subvert them, and they use that subversion as a clever way to keep audiences guessing about what could happen next. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. 
They also incorporate meta humor as a way to draw attention to not only the horror genre, but issues in Hollywood as a whole. Scream 5, on the other hand, abandons subversion in favor of cliche, and uses meta humor to constantly remind people that they're watching a Scream movie that always, always goes back to the original. Rather than saying anything of substance, save for a very surface level critique of what they consider toxic fandom. And how do they do that? By coming to the defense of Ryan Johnson, of all people. What? The movie also succeeds in failing to have any likable characters, composed of a cast of insufferable zoomers, the worst of which is the new final girl, Samantha Carpenter, played by Melissa Barrera, who has all the screen presence of a plank of wood. There's also no mystery to this movie. You can figure out who the killer is pretty easily, the dialogue is clumsy, the third act is an absolute mess, and it all ends on one of the cheesiest one-liners I've ever seen in a movie. Never fuck with the daughter of a serial killer. That's dumb! In short, this movie stinks. And it's just another example of why Hollywood needs to abandon old franchises and move on to something new. Oh, and just on a personal note, Ryan Johnson can suck a dick. It feels so good. Yeah. Uh, that is, that is a Scream movie that happened. The way that they kill Dewey and how hard they go into the death of Dewey is so disappointing in this movie and just so disrespectful to the rest of the series, which already was a series I didn't give a shit about, and it just kind of reinforced that, seeing them take the best actors still clinging on to it and just doing him so dirty. David Arquette is by far doing the best out of anybody in this movie, and seemingly, for the first time in his career, seems to actually give a crap about what he's doing on camera, which is kind of a weird time to start. <laughs> but And then just to have him unceremoniously killed by someone who you find out is like a five foot one, 80 pound girl, it's like, what? Why? This is another example of like a movie on this list where I have trouble hating this movie because the one that comes after it I think is even worse. I almost had to rewatch this movie just to engage with your video on it because I, I was having trouble remembering that it fully existed. Uh, so thank you for reminding me. And that brings us down to our final two selections on the list. I know I've said this whole time that the order does not matter, but now it does. I, I really uh, think that these last two are deserving of all the hate that they get. And I would like to begin by talking about the following film, which I would say is probably the largest jump in quality from original film to its sequel and probably one of the worst sequels ever made. American Psycho 2 should be on the Mount Rushmore of movie sequels that utterly miss the point of their first film. And while the VHS cover of this movie intrigued me enough while I worked at Blockbuster, it really only takes a few minutes or seconds of this movie to understand how fucking miserable it is. Imagine thinking that the closest facsimile to Christian Bale's iconic performance from the original operatic satirical horror epic American Psycho is Mila Kunis. But a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Playing the only victim that escaped the grasp of prolific serial killer Patrick Bateman, Kunis somehow adopts the most brat parts of Bateman's persona, which she unleashes on a stereotypical early 2000s college campus in the form of brutal murder. This is a shallow, grating, godless continuation of a movie series that needed a sequel about as much as the world needs a second Jack Black. I am Steve. The level of pure, putrid cringe that accompanies Mila Kunis's absolute plank of wood performance in this movie will chill your blood and shrink your brain. I mean, all this time I thought he was taking notes, but no, this may be a waste of a rare mind. William Shatner adds a little bit of zest to a movie that has the charm of a genocide. And overall, this disaster feels like The Rage Carry 2 meets Blair Witch Book of Shadows, but somehow worse than both. From the moment you see a Christian Bale impersonator at the beginning of this movie, you know it's going to be a sacrilegious plantation of dirt. And if you can somehow survive this movie's runtime, you will have experienced one of the most toxic sequels ever shat out of the Hollywood machine. Mila Kunis should be forever ashamed of this movie, and of Jupiter Ascending, and of marrying a dude who spent a little too much time at P. Diddy's mansion. For shame on every soul involved in this godforsaken disaster. Yeah, this was shocking to learn. Like, when you told me this was even a movie, I, I was stunned. <laughs> this movie 
was actually a movie called All American Girl, uh, starring Mila Kunis. I believe Lionsgate bought it and added tags at the beginning and end of the movie with scenes with a Patrick Bateman impersonator. They added extra voiceover to connect American Psycho with its misbegotten sequel. So yeah, this was a movie that was not intended to be related at all. Thankfully, unlike The Descent 2, which I think actually makes The Descent 1 look worse, American Psycho still lives on and this hasn't affected that uh, so badly and hasn't really put a, a sour taste on the quote-unquote American Psycho franchise. Whereas the next movie and your final selection, I would say very much has put a bad taint on the franchise that it came from, or at least the uh, 15th reboot of that franchise that was trying to head in the right direction before it all fell apart. So uh, why don't you get us going here with our final selection on uh, the absolute worst horror that we hate, the movie, the video, by Review Bomb and Movie Blues. <laughs> well, <laughs> eloquently stated. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, this movie is just a shining example of what happens when you're given a bunch of money to make a movie and you don't know what to do. Mysterious Ancient Cults, Malcolm McDowell, and Busta Rhymes doing Kung Fu. Trick or treat, motherfucker. Without a doubt, the Halloween franchise has suffered its fair share of stupid moments in its nearly 50 year history, and few of them are as egregious as Halloween ends. The movie where director David Gordon Green cut Michael Myers out of most of the movie and shifted the focus to a sad sack virgin named Corey, who drinks chocolate milk and is bullied by high school band kids. Dork! And he does so by allowing Corey to beat Michael Myers in a fight, <laughs> take his mask, and do all sorts of evil things like stare into mirrors, stand next to bushes, and eat spaghetti with milk, resulting in a movie that confused audiences with terrible writing and strange character choices. Rip off your shirt and show grief your fucking tits. Alienated hardcore fans by making Michael Myers play second fiddle to this guy and causing Halloween Ends to be one of the worst movies in the franchise, competing with Halloween Kills, a movie that was also made by David Gordon Green. Now, after learning all this, it may surprise you that Halloween Ends was actually the final movie in a new Halloween trilogy, a trilogy that started with 2018's Halloween, a movie that most people seem to feel is at least okay. Yes, it also had its fair share of stupid moments, but for the most part, it was fine. However, after the disaster that was Halloween Kills, <laughs> I guess David Gordon Green suffered a stroke or had a nervous breakdown or something and ended up making a movie where Michael Myers transfers his evil to some random kid. How? By staring deeply into his eyes. Now, several people praised the movie for taking a chance on something different, and normally I would be fine with changing things up because when a franchise has been around this long, it can start to go stale. But those changes are supposed to bring new life to the movie, not suffocate it with a pillow like Jack Nicholson in the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. However, to the movie's credit, it does have one of the greatest opening sequences in movie history, where a nine-year-old brat named Jeremy and I don't really feel like pretending to be best friends with an ugly ass boy baby falls to his death. So, it's not a total loss. Much like your choice of Scream, much like your choice of Jason Takes Manhattan, and even your choice of The Ring, I actually hate Halloween Kills so much that I kind of liked Halloween Ends. Uh, in your video, you even kind of said that there might be some people out there who are so uh, sick of Halloween movies that something so stupid and so different would hit for them. And I am that guy. I do own this movie on 4K. I have not rewatched it. I only watched it one time. When I saw it in theaters, I just could not stop laughing. The opening with the kid exploding in the foyer was one of my favorite cold opens I feel like I've ever seen in my whole life. Him transferring his energy into a dork was <laughs> like one of the dumbest things. I, it, the entire theater was groaning. It was like an, an incredible, almost religious experience. Whereas Halloween Kills, the the whole evil must die thing, it that movie was 
so bad. Uh, Halloween Kills is like my last Jedi where it's so bad and it made me so angry that it's it's got a special hate for me in my heart. So I, I'm curious on how you uh, reacted to Kills versus Ends, considering this is your number one. Uh, Halloween Kills, I, I do hate. I have a special place in my heart dedicated to the hate of Halloween Kills. And by every measurable metric, it's terrible. But I will say this stuff at least happens in it. It's all garbage. <laughs> what a benchmark that we've reached here at the end of this list. Stuff at least happens. <laughs> Halloween Ends has its head shoved so far up its own butt uh, and just filled with like angst of like a John Hughes movie. It's like, the, when, how is this a Halloween movie? And I would appreciate it more if it was a new entry in what is a different shift in Halloween. Not the third part of a trilogy because kills ends with, with Michael Myers still being alive. No one knows where he is and kills and 2018 Halloween are the same night. So not only did he just kill people, he killed like 90 people. Why aren't we expending every resource to find this person who is still in town in a sewer? <laughs> Why? Not to mention that cold open takes place the next year after Halloween Kills. If you book a flight on 9-11, people look at you like you're a monster. Like, there are people, <laughs> after he just massacred part of an entire town, th this town is going to have a Halloween? <laughs> no, what are you doing? The, the town would have boarded every window and locked every door. Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? Just, it's just so terrible. And I, I hate it so much. I think I'm now realizing that the reason that I do like Halloween Ends, and it's probably the only of that trilogy that I would revisit, is because it gave up on its own series and just was like, I'm just going to be a totally different movie. And uh, other than that, um, that is our comprehensive uh, 10 item list of horror movies that we absolutely hate. Although if you've been listening to this conversation, it is very clear that we hate much more than this. So if you guys ever want to see us do this again, or if you would like another 10 entries, which I'm sure would flow very easily out of both of our brains, then like comment and subscribe to our various separate channels here, review bomb and the movie blues, uh, Adam, any parting uh, wisdom you'd like to bestow upon our dual audiences here. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I please come to my channel and and argue more with stuff that I don't like and you do like, or vice versa. Vice versa, whatever. It's I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>